Hello, I'm Dean Nassimos, Chairman of the Department of Urology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Medicine. Today I'm going to discuss the guidelines for the management of patients with ureteral stones that have recently been generated by the American Urological Association and the Endourological Society. Kidney stones are a common problem. About 7% of women will develop a stone sometime in their life, and almost 11% of men will develop a kidney or ureteral stone sometime in their life. Uh, kidney stone management consumes a lot of economic resources, billions of dollars per year, especially the management of patients with ureteral stones. I would first like to recognize uh, the Herculean efforts of the guidelines uh, panel in generating uh, this document. In addition, I would like to recognize the American Urological Association support staff as well as our methodologist who was involved in generating these guidelines. Guidelines, uh, in, in guidelines there are, are a number of different statements and I'd like to define these statements. Uh, a strong recommendation is when the net benefit or harm is substantial to the patient, that the benefits either outweigh the risk or bur burdens or vice versa. It applies to most patients in most circumstances and future research is unlikely to change the confidence in the guideline statement. A moderate recommendation is a guideline statement where the benefits exceed the risk or bur burdens or vice versa. The net benefits or harm or net harm is moderate, and it applies to most patients in most circumstances, and future research, again, is unlikely to change confidence in the guideline statement. A conditional recommendation is a guideline statement where the benefits are equivalent to the risks and burdens, that the best action depends on the ind individual patient's circumstances, and then future research is unlikely to change the confidence in the guideline statement. There are other guideline statements that were generated or utilized in this document. One is a clinical principle, and a cl uh, this is a statement about a component of clinical care that is uh, very widely uh, agreed upon by urologists or other clinicians for which there may or may not be evidence in the medical literature. We also had a statement called an expert opinion, and this is where a, uh, a statement uh, is achieved by consensus of the panel uh, that is based on uh, the panel member's clinical training, experience, knowledge, and judgment for which there is uh, no published evidence. We also graded uh, the information that was available for the guidelines evidence. Grade A evidence is evidence from well-conducted randomized controlled trials or exceptional observational, observational studies. Grade B evidence is uh, randomized controlled trials or observational studies uh, with some inherent weaknesses. And grade C evidence is observational studies that are inconsistent or difficult to interpret. In our guidelines, we defined an index patient and that was a non-pregnant adult. The stone was not thought to be composed of uric acid or cysteine. The patient had a normal, has a normal contralateral kidney. The patient has normal renal coagulation and platelet function. The kidney is located in a normal position. The patient has an intact uh, lower urinary tract without ectopic ureters. The patient has no evidence of sepsis. And finally, uh, there's no anatomic or functional obstruction distal to the ureteral stone or stones. We define the ureter based on anatomic regions. The proximal ureter from the ureteral pelvic junction to the sacroiliac area. The middle ureter from the sacroiliac area to the pelvic brim. And finally, the distal ureter from the pelvic brim to the ureteral vesicle junction. We also separated uh, patients uh, based on stone size as well as position. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, stones being divided by the regions of the ureter as well as size, uh, less than or equal to 10 millimeters or greater than 10 millimeters in size. As a strong recommendation, uh, in patients with obstructing stones and suspected infections, 
uh, clinicians must urgently drain the uh, kidney with a stent or a nephrostomy tube. And there's actually a study that uh, was done that uh, demonstrated that, that, that if uh, drainage is not uh, done in this setting, that the mortality rate is significantly higher. Whether this is done with a nephrostomy tube or ureteral stent, the outcomes are similar. I would now like to talk about the role of medical expulsive therapy and observation in the management of patients with ureteral stones. And as a strong recommendation, uh, patients with uncomplicated ureteral stones, 10 millimeters or less in size, should be offered observation. In those with distal stones of similar size, medical expulsive therapy with alpha blockers. We performed a meta-analysis of the, the utilization of alpha blockers in patients with uh, stones 10 millimeters and less in size. And as you can see from our meta-analysis, this demonstrated that uh, alpha blockers uh, resulted in uh, increased stone passage. In particular, uh, the alpha blocker tamsulosin, the most commonly won study, demonstrated this benefit for patients harboring distal ureteral stones. However, an analysis of the utilization of nifedipine, a calcium channel blocker, for patients with distal ureteral stones, less than 10 millimeters in size, demonstrated no benefit with this treatment based on our meta-analysis. Similarly, uh, there was no benefit uh, of alpha blocker therapy uh, in patients harboring proximal ureteral stones with regards to facilitating stone passage. And the same held true for middle ureteral stones. There was a study done uh, in Australia, published recently, uh, that demonstrated the benefit of tamsulosin therapy in patients with distal ureteral stones was really on only for patients with 5 to 10 millimeter uh, size stones and not for stones less than this size. We also performed a meta-analysis of distal ureteral stones and tamsulosin, or the utilization of alpha blockers, and also found that this treatment was only beneficial for uh, patients harboring stones uh, 5 to 10 millimeters in size and not less than 5 millimeters. However, due to the uh, limited number of patients or subjects in these studies, uh, the panel just decided to uh, uh, recommend the utilization of alpha blockers for, for all patients less than 10 millimeters in size. Patients being prescribed uh, alpha blockers to facilitate stone passage should be uh, informed that this is being given in an off-label sort of utilization. As a moderate recommendation, in most patients of observation or medical exp expulsive therapy is not successful in four to six weeks, and or the uh, patient and clinician decide to intervene sooner based on a shared decision-making approach, this, the clinician should offer definitive stone treatment. The rationale for this guideline statement is that the majority of stones uh, in the ureter, uh, if they are going to pass, will do so within a 30-day period. In addition, uh, that with prolonged observation, there is some uh, risk of uh, the development of per permanent renal uh, damage as a consequence of long-term obstruction of the kidney. Uh, as a clinical principle, clinicians should offer re-imaging to patients prior to surgery if passage of stones is suspected or a stone movement will change management. The imaging uh, should be tailored on the region of interest to limit radiation exposure to the patient. Many things should uh, be taken into consideration when considering re-imaging, such as the, the stone size, the stone location, the presence or absence of symptoms in the interval since the initial imaging study was performed. As a strong recommendation, clinicians should inform patients that shockwave lithotripsy is the procedure that is associated with the lowest morbidity but ureteroscopy has a greater stone-free rate in a single procedure. Uh, as you can see from our meta-analysis, uh, patients with proximal, middle, and distal ureteral stones, uh, 10 millimeters or less in size, undergoing ureteroscopy, have a significantly higher stone-free rate with one procedure as compared to shockwave lithotripsy. 
And the same a relationship uh, held true our, in our meta-analysis of stones greater than one centimeter in size, ureteroscopy in all segments of the ureter yielding higher stone free rates with one procedure as compared to shockwave lithotripsy. As you can see from our meta-analysis, the risk of a ureteral injury is significantly higher with ureteroscopy. However, when you look at the risk in itself, it is quite low for sustaining a ureteral injury with ureteroscopy. As a strong recommendation, clinicians should recommend ureteroscopy as the first line of therapy in patients harboring stones in the middle or distal ureter. Again, this is based on our, the results of our meta-analysis, uh, which demonstrate a significantly higher stone-free rate uh, with ureteroscopy in the middle and distal ureteral stone in patients with stones 10 millimeters or less in size. And again, the same thing held true for our meta-analysis for larger ureteral stones, ureteroscopy having superior stone-free rates with one procedure. As a moderate recommendation, uh, if initial shockwave lithotripsy fails, clinicians should offer endoscopic therapy as the next treatment option. That is, if a patient fails shockwave lithotripsy, uh, either ureteroscopy or a percutaneous nephrolithotomy approach should be considered. As a strong recommendation, shockwave lithotripsy should not be used in patients with anatomic or functional obstruction of the collecting system or ureter distal to the stone, such as a ureteroseal depicted uh, in this ultrasound of the bladder. With regards to the utilization of uh, prophylactic antibiotics, the clinician should follow the AUA best practice statement on anti antimicrobial prophylaxis, which would endorse the utilization of prophylactic antibiotics in patients undergoing a ureteroscopic stone removal, but not in those undergoing shockwave lithotripsy. As a strong recommendation, clinicians should abort stone remo removing procedures, establish drainage, and continue antibiotic therapy and obtain a urine culture if purulent urine is encountered during endoscopic intervention. With regards to stenting prior to ureteroscopy, as a strong recommendation, uh, placement of a ureteral stent prior to ure ureteroscopic stone removal should not be performed routinely. While improved stone free rates have been reported with pre-stenting in patients harboring ureteral stones, uh, we did not feel that this should override the added costs of the stenting procedure and the negative impact on quality of life that patients have with a stent in place. As an expert opinion statement, the panel uh, felt that a safety guide wire should be used for most patients uh, undergoing an endoscopic stone removing procedure. As a strong recommendation, clinic clinicians must utilize normal saline for irrigation during percutaneous nephrolithotomy as well as ureteroscopy for stone removal. As a clinical principle, clinicians performing ureteroscopic stone removal for patients harboring proximal ureteral stones should have a flexible ureteroscope available. The reasons for this is that uh, one might not be able to pass a semi-rigid ureteroscope up to the stone. Uh, or, and the other reason is that the stone might migrate up into the kidney and uh, having a flexible ureteroscope will allow one to be able to go up into the kidney and effectively treat the stone. As an expert opinion, ureteroscopy is recommended for patients with suspected cysteine uh, or uric acid ureteral stones who fail medical expulsive therapy or desire intervention. As an expert opinion, a clinician should not utilize electrohydraulic lithotripsy as a first line modality for interureteral lithotripsy. The reason for this is that uh, this form of lithotripsy is associated with a high risk for, of ureteral injury, such as per perforation depicted in this image. As a strong recommendation, following uh, ureteroscopic stone removal, clinicians may uh, omit ureteral stenting in patients uh, that meet the following criteria. There's no evidence of ureteral injury. There's no anatomic impediment to stone fragment clearance. The, uh, the patient has a normal contralateral kidney and normal global renal function. 
and there's no plan to perform a secondary uh, ureteroscopic procedure. It is well documented that patients uh, with ureteral stents in place have, have a lot of uh, irritative uh, and obstructive voiding symptoms and pain. As a moderate recommendation, uh, clinicians may offer alpha blocker therapy and anti-muscarinic therapy to reduce stent discomfort. As a strong recommendation, routine stenting should not be performed in patients undergoing shockwave lithotripsy of ureteral stones. In our meta-analysis, it was demonstrated that patients not having a stent in place during the treatment of a ureteral stone with shockwave lithotripsy actually had higher stone-free rates than those having a stent in place. As a moderate recommendation, clinicians may prescribe alpha blockers to facilitate stone uh, fragment uh, passage after shockwave lithotripsy. As a strong recommendation for a non-index patient group, clinicians should use ureteroscopy as first-line therapy in most patients who require stone uh, intervention in the setting of uncorrected bleeding diatheses or those individuals who require continuous anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. As a moderate recommendation, in patients who fail or are unlikely to have successful results with shockwave lithotripsy or ureteroscopy, clinicians may offer percutaneous nephrolithotomy, laparoscopic, robotic assisted, or open surgical stone removal. And finally, uh, if stone material is retrieved from the patient, uh, the stone material should be sent for analysis, as this will help you formulate how best to prevent future stone events in the patient.